Let's have a word of prayer as we open God's word together. Father in heaven, we are grateful for a time, too, to get into your word and to focus on this psalm that really deals with the joy of being in your sanctuary, being in your house to worship you. And Father, we pray that the joy of the psalmist would be our joy as well together as we reflect on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 84, one of the psalms uh, written by son, the sons of Korah, family of priests that served in the temple. Let's read the 12 verses of this psalm. It's found on page 922. The psalmist writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Friends, the word of the Lord. Dear family in the faith, my grandpa Zaitama was a custodian in God's house. He served for many years as the custodian at the Allen Avenue Christian Reformed Church in Muskegon, Michigan. I remember when I was a child, uh, we would sometimes go to Grandma and Grandpa's house and we'd spend the night from Saturday to Sunday and uh, while we were in church, uh, we always had to sit in the back row because that was reserved for the custodian and his family. And at the end of the worship service, he would always uh, leave during the, the final song and he would open up the doors of the sanctuary for the people going out for fellowship. I remember my mom telling me that my grandpa's favorite verse was Psalm 84, verse 10. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Grandpa was a hardworking servant of the Lord. Whenever I read scriptures that talk about people that serve in God's house, I often think about my grandpa. Grandpa died a number of years ago at the age of 79 back in 2002 when my family and I were about ready to leave Iowa and my first church and to finally move back to Michigan. I remember being at his funeral and, and being involved with that. Now, I'm titling this message this morning, The Custodian's Psalm, not only because of the fact that this psalm contains my grandpa's favorite verse, but also because this psalm is written by custodians in God's house and focuses on them. According to the superscription of Psalm 84, it was written by the sons of Korah. It's one of 11 psalms that are attributed to them. 
The sons of Korah, or the Korahites, were one of the branches of the tribe of Levi who were called to help serve as priests in both the tabernacle and the temple. The Korahites were chosen to be doorkeepers or gatekeepers in the temple. We might call them custodians. Their work was humble, but as we see in 1 Chronicles 26, the Bible approves of the work that they did. It says in 1 Chronicles 26, they were very capable men, men with strength to do the work. The chapter then goes on to say, where each of the sons of Korah were to serve as gatekeepers on the north, south, east, and west sides of the temple. This psalm, this chapter, teaches that God took great care in appointing specific men to be doorkeepers or gatekeepers or custodians of the temple, and he honored them for their faithful service. This psalm is written by gatekeepers who are passionate about the work that they do for the Lord. The sons of Korah urge us to seek God and his blessing in his house. Psalm 84 begins with a a longing, a passion for the Lord expressed by the psalmist for his dwelling place in verses 1 and 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. What's interesting about Psalm 84 is that it's not a song about pilgrims who are coming to Jerusalem for the great Jewish feast. It's also not a psalm about people that were separated from the temple for a time, like David was many times, and as he wrote about in several of his psalms. It's a song, a psalm, of people who are present in the temple who serve in God's house and who are expressing how intently and intensely their hearts yearn and even faint for God and his house. They're saying that their souls yearn for God's house not because they're separated from it, but because it's where they are and where they want to be. It's because of this passion for God in his house that they are serving as gatekeepers in his temple. My grandpa Zaitama loved the Lord, and he loved the fact that he was able to serve as a custodian in the church of God. When I visit with shut-ins from our church, I hear from them over and over again how much they yearn and how much they long to, to worship with God's people again. They have that that passion for the Lord and for his house. And the question we all have to answer is, do we have that same passion? Do we have that yearning too for the Lord and for his place, his house? In verse 3, the psalmist talks about a couple of different birds that have made a home in the temple courts, the sparrow and the swallow. The psalmist says even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may bring her young, a nest near your altar. Some Bible scholars have tried to find hidden meanings or uh, symbolism in the psalmist mention of these two different birds in the temple courts. But more likely, the poet simply sees these birds flying around in the temple while he's on his gatekeeping duty. The psalmist's point is that the birds, just as the birds make their home in the temple and are secure within that temple from their enemies, so may God's people make their home in God and find their security in Him. But I also agree with commentators like Dr. James Boyce who find some poetic meaning in the psalmist's use of both the sparrow and the swallow. And I think we can find that in Scripture. 
Let's look at sparrows first for just a moment. In the Bible, the sparrow is a symbol of something that is almost worthless. In Jerusalem, boys who caught sparrows to get a little spending money could sell two for a farthing and five for two farthings. A farthing was the smallest and the least valuable copper coin in Israel. Yet the sparrow finds a home near God's altar. Will God not also provide a home for you who are worth much more than sparrows? When Jesus was referring to a sparrow's value, he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father in heaven. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. I find this picture of the sparrow finding a home in God's temple to be comforting. In light of the news that we talked about last week of our church likely closing by the end of the year. This verse, these verses, are a comfort for me that God will find a spiritual home for all of us and also a physical home for my family and me. I trust that he will provide for all of us. We're always at home with the Lord wherever we are. Let's take a moment to look at swallows. Just as a sparrow is a symbol of worthlessness, a swallow is a symbol of wandering, of restlessness. A swallow is a bird, as you know, that's always in the air from the earliest glimmer of the dawn till the evening begins and the sun goes down. Those birds are always flying around constantly looking for insects, swooping all over the place. The swallow wearies the watcher who's trying to keep his eye on it. But then the time comes for the swallow to mate and to build a nest and to raise a family. And the swallow builds a nest and sits on that nest to rest peacefully. The swallow is a picture of the soul apart from God and then the soul when it finds God and rests in him. St. Augustine was right when he said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Have you found rest in God, or are you still wandering around like so many people are? You don't need to be restless. God offers you peace. Even the swallow finds a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near God's altar. Of the many ways that we could reflect together on the rest of Psalm 84, I'm going to focus on the three blessings that we find in the rest of this psalm. The first blessing that we find is for those who live and work in the temple, the custodians. The second blessing is for those who are traveling to the temple, the pilgrims. And the third blessing is for those who are not able to come to the temple, but who put their faith in the Lord. So first of all, blessed are those who dwell in God's house. Verse 4 says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. We should be prepared for this blessing now because of the fact that Psalm 84 has been focusing on this from the start. And the psalmist is aware that the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by human hands, as the Apostle Paul will later say to the people of Athens. But God had revealed himself in a special way at the temple with his Shekinah glory coming down from heaven and coming to dwell inside the most holy place where the ark of God was. And even though the visible glory at some point faded, the people of the Old Testament, the Jewish people, 
felt and experienced the presence of God in the temple and in Jerusalem like nowhere else on earth. This is why David wrote in Psalm 27, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. That's why the sons of Korah speak of yearning and even fainting for the house of God. Because God dwelled in Zion, the most favored of all human beings at this time are people who live there too and work there, especially those like the priests who work there day and night as doorkeepers, as worship leaders, as people offering those sacrifices to the Lord. Also, blessed are those who are making their way to God's house. Not everyone could live in Jerusalem, of course. Most of the Jewish people lived outside of Jerusalem in little villages and on family farms. Psalmist doesn't forget these people, and he has a blessing for them too in verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. The rest of this section, verses 6 and 7, describes the blessing of those who travel to Jerusalem from their homes for the feasts. These pilgrims bless every place they pass through as they travel from their home to Jerusalem. Even the Valley of Baca, the Valley of Tears and Weeping, turn it into a place of springs. They go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. And really, brothers and sisters, that's a wonderful picture of the Christian life. Those who have come to know God in Jesus Christ aren't seeking an earthly temple, of course. Instead, we are seeking a heavenly city, the, the heavenly city with foundations, with, whose architect and builder is God. And as we press forward toward that goal, we pass through many valleys of weeping and many autumns with cold and dreary rains. But we're not discouraged by these things. Instead, we rise above them and we go from strength to strength, encouraging each other along the way and blessing the people that we meet along the way. I've been encouraged and helped and blessed by people like this. You and I need to be built up by other people, especially as we face life's toughest challenges. And finally, blessed are those who trust God. This final blessing occurs in the last verse of Psalm 84, verse 12. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Maybe the greatest mistake we can make at looking at Psalm 84 or other psalms like this that focus on the temple is to think that the psalmist is just expressing a passion for the building or for the festivals that take place in and around the temple. While the psalmist did give more importance to buildings and places of worship as Old Testament believers, more than we do today as Protestant believers particularly, we can't associate the worship of God with a particular place like they did. But we fail to understand these writers if we think that all they cared about was the building itself. Really, their true delight is in God. This is why, in spite of the opening verses pining for God's house, the psalm ends with a blessing for the person who simply trusts God. It's a way of saying that Trusting in God is really what life is all about. It's why verse 11, right before the final blessing, doesn't speak about the temple, even though the writer says he'd rather be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of the wicked, my grandfather's favorite verse, as I said. Verse 11 is about God and his attributes. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. 
No good things does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. This is the only place in the Bible where God is explicitly called a son. It's because God shines on us and he brings us the brightness of our days. More than that, God is a shield from our enemies and the only possible source of favor and true honor that we could receive. The last phrase, no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless, is the Old Testament way of expressing Romans 8, verse 28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So let's learn to seek God in the company of his people, the church, and by looking to heaven. I mentioned the church first because God has promised to meet us here. Jesus said, where two or three come together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If we want to learn about God and come to know God personally, it's going to be through the church. It's why we meet together Sunday after Sunday and with Bible studies and other ministries. But I also say heaven. Heaven. Because heaven is ultimately where we're going and what we're looking toward. And ultimately, it's God himself that we long for. And in whom all of our yearnings will be satisfied. Not the fellowship of God's people, as wonderful as that can be. Commentator Alexander McLaren says, If we want to rest, let us clasp God as ours. If we desire a home, warm, safe, sheltered from every wind that blows and inaccessible to enemies, let us, like the swallows, nestle under the eaves of the temple. Let us take God for our hope. And as much as my grandpa Zaitama treasured working as a custodian in the house of God, what he really loved the most was his Lord and his Savior. He treasured and he sought and he trusted God. And that's what we're all called to do. So brothers and sisters, let us seek God and his blessing in his house, our church, and finally, in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us that passion and that yearning and that longing for you. The same longing that the sons of Korah had as they served as priests in your house. And that yearning that my grandfather had and that all of us have as we trust in you and grow in you. Dear Father, help us to, to find our home as those birds did by your altar. God, thank you that you value us far more than any sparrow and you bring our aimless restlessness to an end just as a swallow finds a nest by your altar. Lord God, give us that passion for you and help us to seek you here in the fellowship of our church family and also as we look to you and look forward to the heaven to come. In Jesus' name, amen.